Uh, thank you for a very interesting presentation. So I have two quick thoughts. One is, you know, you're identifying that it's probably the bargaining power channel that is having a role to play. So do you see in changes uh, happening in terms of the expenditure or the decision making that women have, you know, when it comes to expenses on the food expenditure, schooling expenditure and other things, right? Because that would substantiate that this is really the bargaining power that is leading to this differential impact. And the second thing was you are finding this heterogeneity, uh, the impact coming from rural areas, right? And in rural areas, most of the women are engaged in these family farms where they directly contribute to the production, which can be used for self-consumption and directly aids to the, you know, the household's diet to diversity in that sense. And that's what I find in one of my papers that both types of work, labor market engagement as well as home engagement can have an impact. So I was uh, you know, interested in understanding what is really going in the Indonesian context, right? Because you're finding that it's uh, when they are doing this. So is there any trade-off that they're facing in terms of taking labor market employment compared to working on the family farm? Hi, thank you for a very interesting presentation. Just a quick, very quick, small question. Um, you included age, uh, age of the child, as I, as I got, as a uh, control, but you didn't comment anything on the results. And I thought it was like positive and maybe as the, I don't know if you have any hypothesis of, about this, if this is uh, as the child grows up, the maternal employment effect is uh, larger because maybe for smaller kids, uh, one of the two forces is prevailing, or if you have thought about it, or just to comment on that. Thank you. Okay, so thanks for the question. So first point, uh, bargaining power and expenditure. So the, our measure of bargaining power is basically, I didn't talk, uh, <laughs> I didn't have the time to talk about this, is basically um, the expenses that uh, mothers make on food, uh, um, routine expensive purchases, clothes, sports and children clothes. So it also includes, in a way, expenditure for uh, education. So that's basically how we cut your this. Um, the other questions about rural, uh, the, the effect on rural areas. Uh, in my view, it's largely captured by the fact that actually most of these women are kind of uh, in the informal sector. And um, so if, uh, uh, for example, we look at uh, the, um, uh, descriptive statistics, I think I have it here. So um, most of them are like a kind of uh, um, self-employed and, uh, and, and family worker. We have 15% are family worker. So uh, it's uh, largely, uh, you know, comes, comes from this type of employment, which is most we spread, of course, in rural areas. Um, it's also true that in rural areas we might observe, but we don't can observe this in the data, kind of also larger networks of child informal child care provision. So the the neighbor, the which you don't cannot have too much so much in town or in in uh, in uh, urban areas. So this might bring the uh, the effect that we see that, that is only in rural and not in urban areas. And um, and age so. That's basically just the effect of age on child development. So, because it's not interacted with the with the maternal employment, so it basically just means that um, as the child grows, uh, then uh, is which is consistent with the height for age, then the uh, height is uh, you know is improves or with schooling even better. So, it's <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. And not caring much about what other people's perception is, right? So maybe you could, you know, shed some light on that. And the final comment is about the reverse causality here, right? Because it's possible that you know you're marrying them early. So if there are girls who are not married early, they tend to be harassed more, and that's what is leading to this relationship that you are capturing here. Thank you. Thank you very much for the very interesting presentation. I think she, she asked um, the first, the, the question I had about who is asking, uh, whose perception you are capturing has already been asked. But I also wanted to find out what, um, I don't know if I missed it during your presentation, but what are these specific um, questions about, um, you know, about harassment? And then I was wondering if you get to capture, um, you, you, you get to look at the differences in um, effects when you look at actually li like the lived experiences 
um, if, if people actually report that they have been harassed? Was there anything like that in the data? So that you can actually look at the effects for the lived experiences versus the perception to see, you know, if, if there's anything um, going on. And, and I also wanted to find out if you've considered maybe, if, um, I, I guess there are several questions about, you know, perception. So maybe if you can create an index out of it and see, you know, you know what, what you find, instead of maybe looking up one after the other. Thanks. Yes, yeah, so these are very uh, good comments. Um, uh, I, I agree with you that uh, whose perception it is it, uh, it, it matters the most. Um, so I think you, I, I have to, I haven't explored that, <laughs> uh, but you would probably agree that uh, generally when these surveys, the surveyors go to the households, it's the head of the household that they try to interact with. Uh, so I'm guessing maybe that will be the case. Um, but yeah, it will be. It will be interesting to check that who is that. Um, and your other point was uh, related to um, removing that own perception of household from that variable. So you think that that's not a right thing to do? Yeah, yeah. Actually, that's what the paper is trying to do. That the not looking at the actual crime rate, but the perception of households, how they feel, because that we are trying to explore the chastity mechanism. Yeah, so that's a, that's a valid point. So maybe, I, I, I think that the first when I started this, I did it without removing. Um, the results are the same, but maybe I should include it and put it in an appendix or something. And your point about, um, what was your point, <laughs> sorry? Yeah, so, so the, the question is um, how frequently unmarried girls are harassed in the community, in your locality. So that's the question. And all other questions uh, related to the crime, like theft, robbery, so they are the same. And it's, um, the, 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 the answers are um, not never, frequently, sometimes. So that's how it is. Um, Hmm. Yeah, I don't think we have that. Yeah, but that's a good point. Well, we don't have it. Sorry. Hi, sir. Uh, really nice presentation and a lot of interesting insights, but at the same time, some, you know, some which are not very, you know, settling also. So I, I would highlight my concerns. And But first, I want to start with the fact that the wealth shocks, right? So if I understood it correctly, you're talking about weather shocks. It's not just weather shocks, it's, uh, it's all negative positive shocks. It's, uh, uh, it's negative shocks, 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 it's negative income shocks, not wealth shocks, right? And probably that is why you're not able to capture any significant changes when it comes to schooling or early marriages, right? Because these are temporary shocks. Today you have drought this year, next year you might not have it. So keeping the climate change aspect aside, but uh, that's probably one of the explanations why you don't find a lot there. Uh, also, the school expenses, right, they're not very high anyways. And if there are such shocks, the returns to being in the labor market are anyway lower. So you would rather prefer to stay in school where you don't have to pay a lot instead of going to, uh, you know, leaving school and adding to the job market. So that is probably one story you can explore there. The second thing that I found a bit uh, difficult uh, was the bright price, the negative coefficient of the bright price, right? So if there is a shock to income, um, it makes perfect sense that you don't have dowry to pay. But when it comes to bright price, that is the amount that you are going to be receiving if you marry your daughter early, right? So that should have had a positive coefficient, even if it's not significant, but you're finding a negative significant coefficient. That worries me a lot, right? So what is really going on then? Because the story that you're trying to build that doesn't, you know, it doesn't really reconcile with the results you're finding between dowry and the bright price.
So that's where the difference in, with Pakistan comes in. Um, so with bride price, um, yeah, that's true that it would come in from the, father, uh, the husband's side, but a lot of these marriages are within the community, and it, I think I have a very large number of people who are married with their cousins, right? Um, so it's not just that it's a different family, it could be the same family as well, like it could be their cousin, like their uh, Khala's son or something, right? So uh, the effect, I think the shock, if it, ha um, if it affects, so it would be the whole neighborhood basically. So it's not just that the family herself is not able to pay dowry, at the same time the uh, groom's family will not be able to of uh, offer a higher bride price as well. So from the both sides, there would be a decrease, and it would be, um, yes, yeah, so it would it would be more of mutual mutual uh, agreement to do to postpone the marriages. Then, so I should have add that that you know, we have a lot of cousin marriages. I think about eighty percent in this sample, uh, and again, these are first cousins, so like very close relatives. Um, so I I would think that that's the mechanism here. It's not just the bride's family, but also the groom's family that would decide with them. And uh, yes. If, if you actually have a distance, right, if they are within the same locality versus outside the locality. Yeah. Because okay, that's how marriages started, right? Exactly. Being sure against any insurance. Uh, yeah. So in my data, I, I can track where they go and they stay in the same village, basically. Um, I should add that to the paper. I don't have enough <laughs> space left, but that should, uh, I should put that. I was wondering whether your framework allows for dual uh, labor markets, so in terms of infor formal versus informal employment and to which extent your el elasticities might, might differ precisely if you take this into account. So I don't know whether you have done it and what are your thoughts on that. And the second question is, um, I wonder as, as well how well you capture what's going on at the top of the distribution, given that you use survey data. Have you wondered you know, what might be the effect of using admin data to look at what's going on in terms of a gender uh, gap within your model? Very nice paper. Um, two questions. One, I want maybe you could elaborate a little bit more how you think about imperfect substitutability between men and women. Um, and you're thinking about within what you call an abstract occupation, women and men are doing fundamentally different jobs, different things, and that's why they're imperfect substitutes. Um, and the second is, uh, I'm just, this is a small curiosity, but uh, why did you I mean, in, in, in 94, Mexico suffered a humongous labor market crisis, the tequila crisis, right? So, aren't you making your life very difficult by starting in 89? Why do you gain, I mean, I presume that shock changed the labor market in, in very dramatic ways. of labor supply response to wages, right? And for the skilled, unskilled for women, we were seeing that, you know, they were, they, the elasticity is high compared to that of men. So. There are two reasons for which you know this could arise. One possibly could be that they are engaged in different types of skilled work, right? And if that is the case, then it comes back to the point that was made back there, right? That they might not be substitutable after all, right? So, uh, how do you like like do you, do you find something happening there in terms of you know the substitutability and the elasticity, you know, in terms of the interaction of these two parameters? Great. So th th these are great, great questions. Thank you. About the formal and informal, I, I, I think the, the, the model is, is rich enough that we can potentially integrate formal and informal. One of the elements that, again, I've been, we've been thinking a lot is how wage determination is it's, it's, it's done is through, we're essentially perfectly functioning markets. So, so wages equal marginal productivities and we'd like to move into another type of determination. That would be interesting if we move in the direction of formal and formal workers. But I can see ways in which we could extend the model because it's, it's really flexible to, to think about that. That was like the first. About the top of the distribution, we cannot say a lot. So we use survey data. We do some exercises using census data, but that's not gonna really, that's not gonna help you a lot. Um, so yeah. We, we, if you want, you have to be careful about, if you're thinking about the wage gap at the top, you have to be careful of that, although we are always dealing with labor income, right? We're, um, we're not dealing with, with, uh, with capital income, this sort of thing that might be important at the top. That's the second, that's, <laughs> that's a tough question about imperfect substitutability, but it's a very good question I've been thinking a lot about. Personally, I do not think this is technical substitutability. I do not think that there, this is just some things that male, female workers can do or cannot do. What I think is that if you break these occupations, if you really break these occupations at higher digits, what you're going to observe is very strong occupational segregation. And you observe it in the data once you decompose that. So what is happening is that 
females and males are simply working in different occupations once you really go and disaggregate that. And when they're entering those occupations, females are competing with females, not necessarily with males. Is this the, the market is very segregated, particularly at the lower end of the distribution. So if you, if you go at the bottom, that happens if you go at the top in high skill occupations, in, in occupation of people that have tertiary occupations, the mix is much, it's, it's, it's more, I would quote unquote better. So I, I think in, in substitutability in that sense, but that is capturing the model in terms of a technical parameter. And we've had, yeah, I've had some struggles when I present this just to not give the wrong kind of, the wrong interpretation to that, but, but I think that is the case in terms of Mexico. So we use kind of, when I was looking at the gaps in that period, I, 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 we, we don't take exactly the moment, when I was looking at the gaps of the distribution, we don't take exactly 94, 90, 93, 94. So we take before and everything over here estimated over, you know, the, the 20 years, 20 some odd years that we have of the data, but I agree. We have a huge shock over there in 93, 94. Now, th this is a model that is nothing specific, nothing particular to Mexico. This is a model that we can apply and what we're trying to do is Maybe I'll pitch it over here. So we have a wage page for this, and what we're trying to do is just automatize the model so it can apply in other circumstances, because we believe that it, it could be an interesting model just to, to think about these issues in, in other contexts. But, but I agree with, with Julian in that sense. And I, I don't know, and the last is about uh, the wage elasticities of labor supply. Yeah, um, I don't have, the, the only thing that I could say in that, that regard is that our estimated elasticities are very close to what you observe in other uh, estimates of the literature, but you would really have to, not only that, but the, the pattern of becoming less elastic over time that happens between in, in unskill and, and skill, it's, always, it's also something that it's observed, and the fact that essentially male labor supply is basically inelastic. So it's, it's very consistent as to exactly why I wouldn't, Again, I, I could, we don't have evidence on, on that, but I believe it's a super interesting uh, pattern that you're observing. So it's kind of converging more to male in, 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 in that sense. So that's... Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.